and uh, stick with us as we share this bit of history with you. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings and the being out of the cave. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. And the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come here, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of, the, of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage. For thus said, shall the Lord do to all your enemies against those whom you fight. And afterwards Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees, and they were hanging up on the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded that they took them down off the trees and cast them into a cave, into the cave wherein they had been hid, and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remained until this very day. And so we want to ask the Lord's blessing upon our message again, and thank you those that have already prayed for it, and we did forget to take the offer, did we? <laughs> so I guess we can go ahead and take the offer right now before we forget. And uh, as it's coming good, we'll, we'll try to act like we're having extras or whatever, and do a couple other things at the same time. But as we look at what was happening here, um, it's a serious situation, and we face those every day, don't we? So we'll go ahead and, and uh, ask the offer and run at this time. Uh, we look here, and we see it, it names and declares these kings. And uh, I need to back up just a, a bit to let you know that this is perhaps one of the most unusual chapters that we have in the Word of God. And yet, how many times have you heard of Joshua chapter 10 declared one of the most unusual chapters in the Bible? And the reason is because Joshua, God wanted people, he wanted people to see just how great a man Joshua was. And again, the greatness of Joshua was because of his faith in God. And other than that, he wasn't that great a man in one sense. He was a great leader, and many of his military tactics had been studied by West Point and uh, other uh, places where they trained men to fight. And again, some of the things he used, again, he, he just listened to God, and God was able to bless him. But he did something that was so unusual. He prayed in front of all the people because they were fighting a group that was famous, the Amorites. Uh, they, I, I don't know if they had better night vision than other people or they just happened to know the land better than others, but they were really known for being the terror of the night. Uh, if, if you went into battle with them at night, it was almost 100% sure that you were going to lose the battle because they were so that good if you played in darkness. They just had such an advantage over others. And so when darkness was coming, if you please, Joshua just said, uh, folks, we, we have a situation, and it's fixing to get dark, and we're nowhere near with this battle. And so uh, I'm going to pray to God. And he prayed this unusual prayer. The prayer was simply this, and I guess we're looking at verse 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou move in the valley of Ashmon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Wow. Uh, tremendous miracle. Uh, just stop and think about all the things that were involved in the sun standing still. We all know how the universe works, and of course God does too. Uh, and we know how everything rotates around this. And this, you know, the moon orbits around our, our planet and so forth, and how our, our planet and other planets orbit around the sun, and we can just go on and on. 
So what happened? And I've had people, you know, say, well, uh, I think that just God had everything moved together at the same time. So it looked like the moon wasn't going down, the sun wasn't going down, the moon was staying the same. And, and they've done all sorts of things to try to explain it, but we have to realize that God is God. <laughs> and then people go and say, but, but the earth has suddenly stood still and everything, and everybody's going fly off the earth because, you know, it, it rotates around. So we have our gravity pull. And they, anyhow, we just go on and on. It's just an amazing miracle. Even God says it was an amazing miracle. And of course, God, it wasn't that hard for him to do that, but it was such an unusual prayer. Now, can you imagine the leader of your country standing before people and say, we're gonna pray for the sun and the moon to stand still. <laughs> and uh, can you picture the media going, oh, well, he didn't really mean that. He didn't really say that, you know? And then especially um, if he had a relationship with God and it did happen, wow. Would that not magnify that man in your sight? And you got to remember that uh, Joshua had messed up a couple times before this. One of the mess, mess ups was a, a group called the Gibeonites. And remember, the Gibeons, they came to Joshua and they said, we've come from a very, very far country. Look at our bread. And they had moldy bread. Look at our clothes. All this was new when we left our homes. We're from far, far, far away. And they find out they're just a few blocks away that they perceived. But the man of God kept his word because they swore in the name of God. And so he obeyed. And of all things, these five kings were upset because Gideon, of all things, had to make peace, even though they were uh, deceitful in their uh, peace matters, but they had made peace with Israel and with the God of Israel to please. And so they said, we're going to make them pay for it. And so they head after it. And then Joshua and his men marched all night long to get there in time to fight for them. And folks, I don't know if you've ever done an all night march, and, and uh, uh, some of us, you know, we go, man, I, I, I walked a mile today. Wow. You know? And then we got some others that said, well, man, I, I put in five miles a day. Wow. You know, we just think it's fantastic. But we were talking about these folks hiking about 65 miles at, at night uh, with their, if you please, with their weapons and so forth. And you got to remember, when they go into battle, are you ready? They, they're not going to take just one arrow in the back. <laughs> and more likely, they're not going to take just one sword and they're not going to take just one knife. And, and they're not going to just take uh, part of a meal, some sort of snack. Uh, folks, they're getting ready to go down for a whole day uh, and have all these things that are going to happen. And one arrow per, uh, per soldier isn't going to cut it. So they have to carry all these lines, all this distance. And Joshua's ready. He's 85 years old. Uh, folks, I'm not 85, are you? <laughs> you know, and uh, there's no one here that old. I mean, there's some of us that were, were approaching it. Uh, but all these things were against them. And then of all things, they get there and they're fighting and they're putting everything into it. And God is blessing and, and they're, they're having some victories against the Amorites. But as this battle's going on, Father of the Moabites, as this battle's going on, they realize their time for fighting, their time so to speak, the shine is coming. And Joshua makes that unique prayer. Now, could you see how easily <laughs> he could have become a laughing stock and go, can you believe that? Our general prayed for the sun and the moon stands together. <laughs> what is wrong with that? What's he been drinking? What's he been smoking? What's going on? But he had such faith in God. He knew that God could take care of him, that God would take care of him. And of all things, God took care of him just the way Joshua prayed for it to be done. Isn't it neat sometimes that God answers our prayer just exactly the way we, Lord, I'm praying for this, praying for that. And he does it just exactly that way. In my case, so many times I'm surprised, God, this isn't the way I was expecting to be done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But God did this to show that he loved Joshua and that he loved Joshua and he loved the people of Israel. Folks, can you imagine the testimony that this war around that area? Can you imagine people in other areas as they're looking at What's wrong? My, my sundial's not working to stop. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and so many unusual things happen. And so finally, as the battle gets in the thick, five kings realize, man, we goofed. We've messed up. What have we done? And so these five kings, if you please, they go, what, what can we do? So they run for their lives. They find a cave and they hide inside it, no doubt with their honor guard, their bodyguards or whatever. They hide inside there. And sure enough, as they're hiding there, they go and they take care of everyone else. 
destroy the enemy. And finally, Joshua, he told me, he said, just go ahead and cave the cave in and we'll come back and we'll pull them out later. Uh, and then she put a guard there so we could take him to try to dig out. We got him. And so they went ahead and they finished the battle. And when they finished the battle, then they came back to meet with the five kings. And uh, as it gives us the name of these five kings here, Joshua chapter 10, we see that they were men of prominence and all that. We had the king of Jerusalem. And so many times when we think of Jerusalem, we think of a holy city. Uh, we think of a city that's you know been under God's control in place for so many centuries. And yet here we see they had a heathen king. And so as all this was taking place, as it was all coming together, there's some things I think that we can learn. And first of all, I want to emphasize that Canaan, it was not a picture of heaven. And so many times we have a tendency to think, oh, we're going to cross Jordan, and we think in terms of crossing into heaven. But that wasn't the case at all. When they cross Jordan, they are just fixing to really get in the heat of battle. When they crossed Jordan, it was going to be one battle after another battle after another battle that they were going to go through. And yes, they would be victorious over all, basically, with the exception of Ai. But as they went through this, it was a process in which they were able to go grow closer to God. And, you know, the Christian life, let me put it this way real mildly, okay? The Christian life has its ups and it has its downs, okay? And sometimes we may be in between or whatever, and sometimes it may seem like we have more highs than, than usual, you know? And other times it seems like all we have is one low after another low. And sometimes it's amazing we can get so low and we think, there's no way I can get any lower. <laughs> and sometimes that you go, oh, I just thought I was low. I just thought I was down. That's exactly what was happening here. One thing after another. And it was one fight after another. And God was blessing them. And if you please, they were growing. And go, boy, oh, isn't our God amazing? Just think about what God did. Just to get in the land, he, he caused the, the Jordan River to open up. Like I like told us, the same thing happened at the Red Sea with our parents before us. But it just opened up. We crossed over on dry land. And, and got to see the water stacking up on one side. Boy, that was amazing. And, and we crossed over. And we could see them running for the lives when they saw us crossing. And finally we came to that city of Jericho. No way we could take it. Great walled city. And had tremendous fighters there. And always the walls came tumbling down. And one person was spared with her family and friends. Her name was Rahab, a harlot, <laughs> of all things. And so victory after victory. Then AI came and they got overconfident. They said, oh, we can handle this easy. And they didn't even bother to talk to God. And they ended up losing a battle against one of the smallest cities there. All that said, our Christian life is that way. I mean, there's days that we feel so close to God. I mean, it's just so neat. I mean, you just know when you feel he's right there with you. And then there's other days, God, where are you? God, I need you. Folks, I can assure you he's always right there, even when it doesn't feel like he is. And so as we look at what was happening as they entered the kingdom, folks, the Christian life is always going to be a battle. There's always going to be fight as long as we live on this earth. And yes, when we get to heaven, it, as we often mention, well, he's finally made his final resting place for whatever. May he rest in peace or whatever. Uh, just to indicate that once we get to heaven, it becomes a different story. And yet I can't help but think that there's some battles that will take place just right after we get to heaven. But all that said, we see that as they were to be established in Canaan, it was a picture of the Christian life reaching, if you please, a, a certain situation, a certain height, a certain plateau in which we've finally grown up. And I was talking to somebody earlier today, not that much earlier, and just made a comment that somebody has really grown up, really matured. And what a blessing it was to see that that young man had matured. So, and, and folks, that's the natural process of people growing up. I, I love Jonathan. At the age he is right now, he's almost four years old. And sometimes I think he's almost four years old, going on 45. But anyhow, uh, but what I'm saying, I mean, you know, I, think I look at his old brother Luke, and it's just amazing how different that can be. And of course, Luke's just 17 months old. Uh, but you ready? I'm looking forward to them growing up. 
And I'm looking forward to one day being able to sit down. I had a couple of these discussions with uh, Jonathan already. And, uh, you know, we just talk about some things, you know, things that are happening about people getting saved and stuff. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to him saying, hey, my grandpa, guess what happened today? And then sharing something along the spiritual line, something that's happened that shows his, his growth or his maturity, or maybe even him coming and saying, Dad, I, 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 granddad, I met this certain girl. She's really, you know, right now, girls are just, uh, anyhow, they don't mean a lot to me, uh, except for mom. But, but anyhow, what am I trying to say? Growing up is really a wonderful line. And how many of us can look back on our life and there's certain things that we, we think as a kid, we remember this, we remember that or whatever. And, uh, and we go, man, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. What was I thinking when I did that? You know, we look back at those things. And, uh, and, and then so us go, thank you, Lord, for sparing me. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for giving me to where I'm at right now. And what I'm saying there's always going to be something that hinders. As I look at this first king that was mentioned here, the king of Jerusalem, uh, I guess we could compare it to, he was definitely a shrewd king. And I think as we think in terms of this king that he was able to get all these other kings together to go fight against the Gideonites. Of course, they weren't planning on fighting against God's people. And I think in their mind, they thought, you know, Israel is probably upset about what Gideon's done to them. And so, we won't have to worry about them coming in on the scene, but we'll be able to take all our, our madness and our vengeance out upon you know Israel, upon the God and all this stuff, upon the Gideonites. And we won't have to worry about you know seeing those Hebrews there. Why would they help these people that lie and con to them? You know why? And uh, anyhow, all that said, the unexpected happened because God's leader kept his word. Don't you love it when a president keeps his word? <laughs> or a governor keeps his word? Or somebody's authority? They do exactly what they say they're going to do for good and people. And so as a result, what this team reminds me of is the danger of compromise. How many times as, as a Christian do we compromise? You know, how many times even in a day do we compromise our testimony by doing things or listening to things that we shouldn't listen to? How many times do we maybe watch something that we shouldn't have watched? How many times have we thought something that we shouldn't have thought? And, and, then, and then we just cover up or, or maybe we say something, but what, it's just a white lie. You know, everybody tells a white lie. It's okay. Folks, we give in the compromise way too much. I mean, if we compromise once in a day, that's too much, folks, if we want to be real and honest about it. And so here they just let this little compromise, it'd be okay. And so if you please, the king of compromise will enter into our life and we'll try to soft pedal a situation instead of saying, I'm going to stand up for my convictions. I'm going to stand up for what God wants me to stand up for. And I'm going to put God first in this situation, even though I probably won't be popular with a lot of people, but I, I'm not going to compromise myself. I'm not going to uh, become a social drinker. I'm not going to become a social gabber or whatever. I'm going to keep my life straight for God. I'm going to bring honor to Him. And so that first king, we see that compromise that's so easy to get involved in. And folks, anytime you let any of these things in, guess what? You may be here on this plateau in your relationship with God, but when you allow compromise to come in, you're going to find yourself back down here. And we can't afford to do that. And then the next king, if you please, as we look at this king, and I'll just call him simply the king of Blair. And what do you mean by that? You ever have somebody watch you? <laughs> Haven't we all? And, and people look at you. But let me put it this way. You ever felt like people were judging you? And, and maybe when you come, you know, like, it's funny, I, I, I always try to, see my wife before I leave to make sure I'm dressed properly. I don't know if that sounds proper, but anyhow, to make sure that I, you know, I got my, my, my tie coming back here. And several times uh, I've come in, Brother Hall said, our pastor, and he'll pull my thing. And I, that tells me that I didn't see Martha before I left, or she didn't look at me like she said she would. But what I'm saying is, uh, I, I appreciate that. So I went in today, uh, I had on my, my jacket there and everything, and I said, what do you think? He said, oh, I know what you're trying to do. I said, what's that? He said, you're trying to draw attention away from your eyes, your red eyes, by the way you're dressed. You know? so, I guess so, but anyhow. But what, what am I trying to say? But how many times do people look at us 
And you can feel them judging you. You can feel them looking at you and they're going, oh, I wonder why he did that. I wonder why he sat so close to the preacher. I wonder why, you know, and, and you, you start, you know, they start doing all these things. Then they'll say things and you realize that their heart's not right with God. And, and as they're judging you, we have a tendency to let them affect us in the wrong way. And folks, God forbid that we judge someone because the Lord makes it very clear, judge not lest you be judged. And there's so much in that. And simply, that king, if you please, gets us involved and we become uh, trying to get our own standard adopted as the standard to live by. Folks, we need to follow God's standard. At any time we let someone intimidate us, any time that we become an intimidator too, it's a dangerous thing. And yet it's so easy to judge others now. Isn't it amazing? I mean, uh, last week we, we talked about the mold. We talked about the beam. And this is a great part of the message last week. And it is strange that a person has a giant beam in their eye and seems like they just, you know, they don't even realize it's there. And then they see somebody has a little mold in their eye. And next thing you know, they're trying to get that mold up and they got this giant beam in their own eye. Isn't it amazing how, how big things may be in our own life? And yet we look at others with small problems that they have. And we're like, how terrible that is. And then the next king, number 75 kings, was the one that, uh, if you please, the one that he looks at himself as being free born. By that, I mean, he looks at himself and he's actually what we would call a battle. And he's always willing to go here, go there, go about, whatever. He's always looking for another church. He's always looking for another group of people. He's always looking for some other way to uh, emphasize uh, his uh, spiritual maturity, okay, or his spiritual ripeness. And that's a dangerous place to be. And simply put it, they just jump from pillar to post and they, they go about doing, looking for whatever feels comfortable to them instead of doing what God wants them to do. And so, folks, we need to follow God and we need to be careful of becoming an independent spirit because I'm referring to becoming independent from God. Folks, we need to depend on God. We need to rest upon God, and we need to let God help us to, to get the foundation that we need in our life. And so I think of the fourth king that must be conquered is the king of decline. And I guess the best way to get this across, it's so easy to see something that needs to be done. And I don't know if Charlie's had this happen to him or not. And somebody come up and say, hey, Charlie, the pizza is dark out there on the porch. Uh, you know what? Uh, Charlie doesn't get paid to do that. He does it for the Lord. But why couldn't you pick up that trash out there? It's to say, Charlie, there's a piece of trash out there. Go pick it up, you know? And, and what I'm saying is, it's so easy for us to shirk our duties, folks. And it's so easy for us to sit here and say, you know, we had a visitor study and and I just watched him, and nobody shook his hand or shook her hand. Why didn't they do it? What's wrong with them? How come they're so unfriendly? Uh, well, excuse me. Uh, why didn't you shake their hand? Huh? <laughs> why weren't you friendly with them? You just want to say, we need to be friendly with those people. And since they're all the preacher needs to talk to that person, <laughs> you go ahead and you talk to them. What a shame. They're so easy to shirk and say, well, somebody else can do it. After all, the preacher gets paid to be friendly. <laughs> so, okay. You really can't pay me enough to be that friendly. But anyway, what I'm trying to say. The spoken is sad that so many times we shirk our duties as Christians and we say, well, somebody else should do that. You do what God's called you to do. If you see something, God helped you to see it. So you need to do something about it. And so, folks, let's do what we can to make a difference. Don't let that, you know, just shirking our duties. And, and, and if you please, those type of people out of place to discourage others too. And so, folks, uh, I don't know about y'all, but I join in a good, godly amen every now and then, a good hearty amen. Mm -hmm. And but you know what I've seen happen? So now I hear somebody say amen. I go, man, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, like sing to a bulldog. <laughs> anyhow, uh, see the bulldog resemblance. But, but anyhow, <laughs> what I'm saying, then somebody else kind of maybe looks back at it. And so suddenly they stop saying amen because they're afraid somebody's being disturbed by it. But folks, there's nothing wrong with encouraging people as to preach and to continue to preach what's right. And, and a lot of times, you know, the best time to say amen is when your toes are getting stomped on, you know. That's a good time to say amen because I know that's right. And I know that God's got you say that to me because I need to hear that. Go ahead. Do it more. Thank you. Oh, wow. I got some. I, I, had a, I had an Aunt Pearl in Texas. And Aunt Pearl... Uh, I don't know whether I understood she weighed about 
325 pounds, just a little bitty lady. But she was, you know, about six foot tall, so I guess, you know, for a woman, that was something. But she would have a tendency to get real excited. And when she got real excited, everybody knew Aunt Pearl was getting excited. And when she got real excited, she'd take out her hanky and she'd start waving. And you know, remember services like that? People waving her hankies. And then when she got really excited, she'd be waving two hankies. You know, like, praise the Lord, praise God. You know, they just get all excited about it. And uh, she was there in Decatur, Texas. But anyhow, uh, but she would get excited about the things of the Lord. And the preachers, when she did it, the preachers got more excited. It just got, wow, I was going to say the right way. And they just got to preach a little bit harder, a little bit louder. And she'd get more excited. And what I'm saying, there's nothing wrong with getting excited about God working. And God working in our lives and the lives of others and bringing them to that same knowledge. The last king that I look at here in this cave, please. The last king is the king of discouragement. And I think of all the weapons that the devil has, that perhaps the strongest weapon he has is the weapon of discouragement. And it comes to the maze how easy we can get discouraged, how easy something can happen, and the next thing we know, we're suddenly, <laughs> we're in the dumps, and we're seeing things the, the wrong way. And no matter what happens, it's just, nothing seems to, make any difference. It don't, don't seem to make any difference for good, I put it that way. And folks, the things I know is about discouragement. When somebody gets discouraged, it seems like they're not satisfied with just them being discouraged. They want to help pull somebody else down. They want to help discourage someone else. And I go, did you hear the preacher? Man? He just went so long. Why did he go so long? What was the deal there? I mean, he already got his point across. He didn't even go that long. You know, and, and next thing, well, I guess you're right. You know, and, and it's so easy to let other people influence us. But folks, when, <laughs> folks play, when somebody's encouraged and they let others know they're encouraged, they can get encouraged too. And, and so when we think about all these things, think about what happened on that tremendous day. I mean, shouldn't people have been running around? Wow, did you see that? Joshua, our leader, he prayed for the sun to stand still and the moon to stand still, and they did. Wow, what a man of God. There's all these other distractions happening too. But what a man of God that he would dare pray something so foolish, son, yet so magnificent. <laughs> God answered that prayer. Wow. I, I wonder how long did Joshua have to sit down and like, could I pray a really wild prayer? And I know that God's going to answer. I, I, I don't know. But the sun and the moon stood still. And according to what I've heard, I've heard there's different things that show evidence that that did happen. So I don't know. But folks, uh, let's do what's right. And don't let the kings of discouragement, the kings that would compromise our testimony, don't let them destroy us. Don't let them pull us down. Would you stand to your feet as we begin our invitation? Lord, thank you for this time we can come together and study your word and help us to see the importance of being ready to fight for you, being ready to, to look for things that are just so strange to the world, but yet just something that you can take care of. We think of our daughter Lydia and her health condition right now and what's been said by the doctor that she needs to be flown out. And then we, we hear the impossible uh, amount that would cost us. Levi said here a moment ago, $250,000 to fly her to the hospital. Wow. Just, uh, there's no way. But we serve a great God. And we know, Lord, that you can work it out. And, and, and my hope and prayer would be that you just kill her up and she wouldn't have to have the doctors and that they'd scratch their head and go, we don't know what happened here, but uh, you're better. <laughs> That's what we would love to hear. And help us to pray according to your will, Lord. And I'm so appreciative of our kids and the fact that they love you completely, they trust you, and they're not worried about anything, even though there's life-threatening situation here. Lord, help us. Help us to, to keep growing. Help us not to reach a plateau and just fall down from there or, or not go any higher, but help us have a desire to get closer and closer to you in our relationship. Thank you for the illustrations that you give us here in Joshua chapter 10. 
In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, God bless you. Thank you for coming. And I hope that would encourage you what we shared with you. And uh, we had some new folks that some of you hadn't seen yet, so we're going to kick our chance to meet some new folks here. Let's see what you know. My name is Carmen.